So let's go right forward. And let's put some definitions on the board. Uh, for the record, the next section means section 2.2. The models in the previous that we were just looking at, the population models, were what are called autonomous. Definition a differential equation is called. Autonomous, autonomy, autonomous, if it has the form the XDT equals f of x. And the key point here is that t does not appear on the right-hand side. This differential equation this differential equation is autonomous, where using P's instead of X's, but dP dt equals alpha P times P minus delta over alpha. And our independent variable is pi. The population is changing as time passes. But you see that t does not explicitly show up in the equation. In this model, the derivative of the population depends only on the current population. And a lot of models are autonomous. Sometimes they aren't. You know, if you wanted to create a really advanced population model for a specific type of animal, you would probably want to include the fact, you know, if the animal has a breeding season. And then you would want to look at gestation periods as well, instead of treating birth as being instant. And once you start having to model things like that, you know, it will take five months for birth to occur. Well, your differential equation is basically going to have to have time in it explicitly. So there certainly are non-autonomous differential equations, but a lot of important differential equations are autonomous. And we give this definition, section 2.2 .2 is fixed points. And section 2.2 .2 is specifically interested in looking at fixed points of autonomous systems. So all of the stuff that we're going to do in this section only works when we have an autonomous differential equation. Definition. 
We've basically been using this phrase already, but let's put it down for the record, as it were. A fixed point didn't quite want to write that, a fixed point for a critical value is an X value where the derivative equals zero. The textbook tries to draw, or the textbook does draw, a distinction between fixed points and critical values, but that distinction is not going to be important. For our purposes, we can think of these as being the same thing, and I am pretty much always going to use the phrase fixed point as I talk about these. And then, let's see, do you want to call this a theorem? Do you want to call this a statement? Autonomous first order differential equations can be largely understood. in terms of their fixed points. I guess that's too informal to want to call it a theorem, but you can always perform the same kind of analysis that we performed here. So you draw the number line and you find the fixed points. And then in between the fixed points, you find whether the derivative is positive or negative. And if the derivative is positive, x goes up, and the deriv if the derivative is negative, x goes down. So maybe you find that the derivative is positive here, negative here, negative here, and positive there. And let's say our values are three, five, seven. This allows us, this chart that we've just put on the whiteboard, allows us to totally analyze the long-term behavior of this system. Put on put any initial value on the board. Let's say at time zero, x is eight. Okay, so we start here, the arrows pointing to the right. 
So we keep increasing and we blow up to infinity. Or say that at time zero, x is 6.5. So we start here. Well, the arrow's pointing to the left. So we decrease, we go down until we reach that five. In these autonomous differential equations, you can think of the fixed points as barriers, like locked doors. You cannot jump over a fixed point. So if we start here, we go downwards, but once we reach five, we're stuck. There's no way to jump over five. So basically, the same model as the population model. Newton's law. of cooling. Newton's law of cooling would not be written this way when you first see it in high school physics or whatever, but Newton invented calculus, or at least co-invented calculus, and Newton's law of cooling was written as a differential equation. I mean, again, it would, he wouldn't have literally written it like this because he used different notation for the derivative, this ddt dt, that's the Leibniz's notation, Newton's hated rival, but he expressed his law of cooling as a differential equation. Here K is a positive constant. It's very normal in the field of differential equations to want all of your constants to be positive. So you see, I mean, we've got a negative sign in front of the K. So we could just say, we could scribble that out and then say that K is a negative constant, but that's not how we tend to do things. We tend to like our constants to be positive, and if something needs to be negative, we'll put in a negative sign, like we do here. Um, K is storing various information. You know, some things cool quicker than others. So K is storing how quickly the substance cools. If the substance is in a container, you know, an insulated thermos versus a bowl, that will affect how quickly the substance cools and K stores that. So K is storing a bunch of information. A, by contrast, is the uh, is only storing one thing. A is the ambient temperature. So you take something out of the oven and you put it on the stove to cool. Well, A is the temperature of the room. You 
So A is just, you've got some object that's sitting in some environment. A is the temperature of the environment. So let's analyze what happens. There aren't going to be any surprises here. We should already know what will happen just from living our lives. If you take something out of the oven and leave it in a room for long enough, that will cool down to room temperature. But let's see if we can get that as a mathematical result. We'll start by finding the fixed point. Divide both sides by negative A. And we find that this ambient temperature is the fixed point. I say the fixed point there can be more than one, but here there isn't. There's only the ambient temperature. Um, what's happening to the right of A? What's happening over here? Well, if T is greater, then the ambient temperature, then T minus A is positive. We multiply by a negative number that flips the inequality. So the derivative is negative. And negative derivative corresponds to leftward movement. So if the temperature is big, the temperature is decreasing. And precisely the same sort of argument shows that if T is less than A, well, T minus A is negative. We multiply by a negative number. That flips the sign. To the left of A, the derivative is positive. So this is showing us precisely what it should show us. If we take a hot object and place it in a cooler room, the temperature will drop until it reaches the temperature of the room. And although this is traditionally called Newton's law of cooling, it works perfectly well the other way. If we take a cold object out of the refrigerator and put it into a room, the temperature will increase until it reaches the ambient temperature. So we are getting, um, we're getting what we expect to get. We're getting what years of life ought to tell us we get. Um, no great surprises here. Again, we jumped a little ahead and we performed the same kind of analysis with the doomsday extinction model and the logistic 
model. So we've performed this kind of analysis three times already. We'll perform it again when we get to air resistance. You've probably heard the phrase terminal velocity. Terminal velocity is a fixed point, and we'll study it using this material. For now, let's talk about stability. And I don't know why, what that word was for example, um, specifically, every fixed point has a stability type. And stability, I was trying to get this, um, sort of get at this when I was talking about the animal populations. In this class, the differential equations we're looking at are totally deterministic. There is no randomness in them. Well, there is no what we would call noise. Well, any real world situation is going to have randomness. It's going to have what we call noise. You know, going back to the animal population, there's a harsh winter that causes the animal population to drop unexpectedly. There's a bountiful harvest and the scavenger animal population is able to thrive and it grows unexpectedly. There's a uh, whatever. There are a thousand things that would affect an animal population. Um, and those things are not in the model. There's absolutely no possible way that our model could include everything that could happen to the animals. So instead of trying to put everything that could be in the model into the model, a totally hopeless task, we instead create these simpler models and then we add no. We say, well, here's our model, but also there's randomness. There's stuff moving around randomly due, due to factors that aren't in the model. Is that good? I mean, is that clear to everyone? And there are very formal ways of doing this. Again, we're not worried about the details. Let's look again in the logistic model. We had a fixed point that looks like this. In the extinction doomsday model, we had a fixed point that looked like that. And our model is telling us that if we're sitting at this fixed point, we stay there forever, but actually that's not true. We put noise in our model and our noise buffets it or us around and the noise of the model is going to take us off the fixed point. Well, once we're taken off the fixed point, though, we'll go right back to the fixed point. And we take it off the fixed point by random perturbations. 
but because of the way the arrows are pointing, if we're bumped off the fixed point, we then return right to it. Compare that to this model, where if we're bumped off the fixed point, we then move further and further away from the fixed point until the animal population becomes extinct. Or if we're bumped off the fixed point in the other way, the population grows without bound and destroys the local ecosystem. So two fixed points, but we're seeing very different behavior. In the first case, you know, random noise is bouncing us around a little, but if we start at the fixed point, we stay at the fixed point, or we stay near the fixed point. We get bounced off it, but then we come back to it. Here, random noise is bouncing us around a little, and that random noise stops us from being at the fixed point. We get bounced off the fixed point, and then the model takes us far away from the fixed point. Definition. A model, not a model, sorry, a fixed point is a stable if initial conditions. that start near the fixed point remain near the fixed point. So going back, to our extinction doomsday model, this fixed point is not stable. Because of the way the arrows are pointing, an initial condition that starts near the fixed point goes away from the fixed point. On the other hand, I too far. Thought maybe I could just erase everything. On the other hand, the fixed point we have here is stable. If an initial condition starts near the fixed point, it remains near the fixed point. In fact, it does something better than that. If an initial condition starts near the fixed point, not only does it remain near it, it actually gets closer to it. It goes towards the fixed point.
definition. A fixed point is asymptotically stable if it is stable and initial conditions that start near the fixed point actually converge to the fixed point. And if you are looking for help online or using textbooks that are not our textbook, I urge caution because these definitions are standard and correct. But somehow or other, a lot of people who ought to know better talk about fixed points being stable when what they actually mean is that a fixed point is asymptotically stable. In their defense, in one-dimensional um, You've got a number line, you've got a first order differential equation. You're not going to see fixed points that are stable, but not asymptotically stable. That's because in this situation, if you've got a fixed point, I mean, there are really only four combinations of arrows that you can have, right? The arrow on the left points right, then the arrow on the right points right, the arrow on the left points right, but the arrow on the right points left, both the arrows point left, where the arrow on the left points left and the arrow on the right points right. This situation is asymptotically stable. What about the other three cases? Definition. And these definitions are, of course, a little informal, but I think they're good enough for our purposes. If an initial condition that starts, if an initial condition can start near a fixed point, but then go far away from the fixed point, that fixed point 
is called unstable. Well, the opposite of stability, as one might expect. And here, these fixed points are all unstable. including, um, let's look at this top one, this initial condition, if you start near the fixed point, this doesn't move away from the fixed point. It moves towards the fixed point. But this initial condition, if you start near the fixed point, does move away from the fixed point. So I browsed a little about textbooks and such using stable and asymptotically stable as if they're synonyms, but kind of in their defense. I mean, in this situation, there are no fixed points that are stable, but not asymptotically stable. So you can see why they don't feel the need to clearly separate those concepts. However, we're eventually going to move into two-dimensional space. And in two-dimensional space, it's easy to have fixed points that are stable, but not asymptotically stable. The way you do it is you have a fixed point, and then you have initial conditions near the fixed point, orbit around the fixed point. They're not unstable because they don't go far away. They're not asymptotically stable because they don't approach the fixed point. They are stable, but not asymptotically stable. So it is possible to have that situation, and it's worth getting our terminology down early on so that we don't run into confusion down the line. We are not done with this section, but, oh, I guess I have one more thing to say that will at least take us to the end of class. Um, some authors will, I mean, I'd say some authors, it's pretty standard terminology, will say that if we have this picture or this picture, we are semi-stable. Semi means half, and the reason for this terminology is that the fixed point cuts the plane into two pieces, cuts the number line into two pieces, I mean. And on one half of the number line, if we start near the fixed point, we approach the fixed point as if we were asymptotically stable. I hate this terminology. There's nothing that can be done about it at this point in time.
But it makes it sound like you have three classifications, it's either stable or asymptotically stable, either asymptotically stable or unstable, and then in between them, you have semi-stable. And that implication is incorrect. Semi-stable fixed points are a type of unstable fixed point. Because an initial condition near the fixed point and go away from the fixed point. And that's all you need for instability. Yeah. We'll continue our discussion of fixed points on Thursday. We'll finish this section and then we'll apply this material to um, looking at motion and air resistance. And I will see you both then. See you, my online students as well. See them digitally. Yes.